Okay, I think we're ready to begin. So, uh, welcome and good evening. My name is Samir Gandesha, and I'm a um, professor in the Department of Humanities here at Simon Fraser University. Uh, and I'm also the director of the Institute for the Humanities. Um, gives me uh, tremendous pleasure um, this evening to welcome you to our um, inaugural Professor Chin Banerjee Memorial Lecture in Anti-Racism. Um, and this will feature uh, a talk uh, about her co-authored new book um, entitled Rehearsals for Living by Robin Maynard. Um, before we um, move on to introduce um, the various people involved in the, in, in the evening tonight, uh, I would like to first acknowledge that this event is taking place on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Swiss- nations. Um, I'd also like to mention that this event is organized, um, of course, by the Institute for the Humanities, but also co-sponsored uh, by the Dr. Hari Sharma Foundation, the West Coast Coalition Against Racism, and the South, Ec- the South Asian Network for Secularism and uh, Democracy, or SANSAD. Just a word about the, um, the lecture itself. Um, this annual lecture, co-hosted by us, the Institute for the Humanities, um, and the other partners that I, I just mentioned, um, is to commemorate the life, work, and political activism of Professor Chin Banerjee, who passed away on July 29th, um, 2020. And we had actually been trying to organize this lecture since, I think, the spring of 2021. And because of the pandemic, of course, it just kept, kept being pushed back and pushed back. But finally, he, here we are. And it's, it's really exciting um, to finally have Robin here to, uh, um, to present her work and, and to engage in, in a dialogue with, uh, with Glenn Coltart. I'm really delighted to have Glenn uh, here as well. Um, Professor Banerjee taught 18th century and restoration English literature literary criticism, and post-colonial studies here at SFU for 35 years. An accomplished teacher, celebrated by students and colleagues, he was also an active and esteemed human rights and anti-racism activist in the Vancouver community for 45 years. So we thought it would be particularly um, fitting to honor his legacy with uh, an annual memorial lecture in anti-racism. During his graduate studies at Kent uh, State, Um, Chin began his lifelong involvement with progressive politics, starting with protests against the Vietnam War. On May 4th, 1970, Chin, while trying to bring his four-year-old son, Anand, who is right here today, um, to campus preschool, was turned away by nervous National Guardsmen who pointed rifles at the car. A few hours later, four students had been shot dead, and Chin's perspective and political allegiances uh, had crystallized. From then on, there was no compromise for him. And that's really how he lived his life. That was the model that he offered, was somebody who made no compromises, even while being extremely generous and being able to work with uh, a, a wide range of, of individuals and, and, and organizations. And he, he sets just a, a, a wonderful example for those who, who come after. So um, what I'd like to do now is introduce a long time friend and comrade in arms uh, of Chin's, and that's Harinder Mahil, um, and who will then uh, say a few more words about Chin and introduce um, our uh, speaker come moderator tonight, Glenn Coltart. Harinder Mahil has been uh, a labor anti-racist and human rights activist since the 1970s. Over the last 50 years, he has worked for the New Westminster local of the IWA, the province of BC, and the Professional Institute of Public Service of of Canada. He he was one of the founders of the Canadian Farm Workers Union and BC organization to fight racism. He was a chair of the British Columbia Council of Human Rights from 1992 to 1997 and a human rights commissioner for the British Columbia Human Rights Commission from 1997 to 2002. He worked closely with Professor Banerjee in the BC organization to fight racism. Dr. Hari Sharma Foundation and the West Coast Coalition uh, Against Racism. And that really was the, this last, organi- la- this latter organization, the West Coast Coalition Against Racism was really the brainchild of, uh, of, of Chins. Um, and there are other members of this organization from the executive uh, who are here as well. Uh, It's great to have them with us. Um, So presently, 
um, uh, Harinder is a board member of Sansad, secretary of the uh, Dr. Hari Sharma Foundation and president of West Coast Coalition Against Racism. It was recently announced that he will be honored in, in December with the Order of British Columbia. So please uh, uh, welcome Harinder Mahal. Thanks, Samir. Uh, it uh, gives me great pleasure to stand in front of you and talk about my friend, colleague, and comrade, Professor Chen Banerjee. I met him for the first time in November or December 1975. And we remained friends until the day he died on June 20, 29th, 2020. For 45 years, we were personal friends and political friends. Uh, I saw him as my teacher, as my mentor. He, um, as Smith talked about him, was a professor of English lit literature, but I just don't know how he t found time to teach because he was involved in so many organizations. At one point, he was the president of the Dr. Hari Sharma Foundation. He was president of South Asian Network for Secularism and Democracy, known as Sansad. He was uh, president of uh, uh, South Asian Film Education Society. We just, every time we saw him, we called him chairman because he was chairman of everything, all the organizations that we belong to. Um, in, in 1979 or 1980, I worked with him and founded the BC Organization to Fight Racism, which was quite active for about uh, 10 to 15 years. This was a period that Ku Klux Klan was trying to establish a foothold in British Columbia. Um, this organization held a number of demonstrations, uh, called on the provincial government to, to take steps so the KKK does not get a foothold in, in our province. Professor Banerjee was one of the supporters of the Canadian Farm Workers Union. Basically, he was like a trade union activist. Wherever there was a picket line, wherever there was a strike, he would go there and encourage us to participate as well. He was a founding member of an organization called Non-Resident Indians for Secularism and Democracy, which eventually became the South Asian Network for Secularism and Democracy, because those of us who were um, participant in the organization, who were its members or supporters, were talking about issues more than India, more than were talking about what was happening in South Asia. Throughout his life, Chin was devoted to ideals of democracy in India, which, of course, where he was born. Whenever protests arose against government authoritarianism and attacks on minorities, he always supported them. He spearheaded local and protests in British Columbia against the lynching of Muslims, the attacks on students and professors at JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, which is the premier university in, 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 in India, and the attacks on Dalits. He leaves behind a legacy of activism in the service of humankind. He inspired many people to fight for a better world of secular democracy and human rights, and his example and inspiration lives on. Uh, as uh, Samir talked about, or I uh, indicated, he was the first president of Dr. Hari Sharma Foundation, 
The foundation, in addition to sponsoring cultural events for many local and international organizations, has coordinated international conferences and cultural events on migrant labor, Sufi thought, racism, and environment. The foundation has also funded multiple research projects and scholarships. We give out a, a graduate scholarship at SFU each year in the amount of $10,000. And each year, we spend about forty dollars to $50,000 on research projects um, for graduate students and academics. In the last 12 years, uh, the, the foundation has given grants and scholarships in the amount of about $600,000. One of the, the last acts of my friend and colleague and comrade, Jim Banerjee, was to establish an organization called West Coast Collision Against Racism. Uh, with the emergence of far right in Canada and beyond, organizations such as this are sadly still needed in, in our country. I find that, that he indeed continues to inspire us. Just about a week or so ago, uh, there's a memorial not too far from here called Kamagata Maru Memorial. Um, this has been damaged a number of times, vandalized. This happened again a week ago. So I got a, an email from a friend who happens to be sitting here. What do we do about it? I thought about Jin Banerjee. What would he do? Let's go and have a, a protest rally at the site and demand not only denounce the, what, the, the vandalism that took place, but demand that something much more serious be done about hate in Canada. So it, there was a rally against hate that we, we took out last Saturday, and we all thought of Dr. Banerjee. This is the inaugural lecture uh, in anti-racism, and we hope that this would become the best known lecture in anti-racism in the country for many, many, many years to come. Now, I'm going to introduce our moderator, um, Glenn Coltard. He is a Yellow Knives Denny and an associate professor in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program and the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia. He's the author of Red Skin, White Mask, Rejecting the Colonial Politics of Recognition, a book that is available if you want to get it outside. Um, winner of the 2016 Caribbean Philosophical Association, Association France Fanon Award for Outstanding Book, the Canadian Political Science Association's C.B. McPherson Award for Best Book in Political Theory published in English or French in 2014-15, and the Rick Davidson Studies in Political Economy Award for Best Book in 2016. He's also the co-founder of Dicinta Center for Research and Learning, a decolonial indigenous land-based post-secondary program operating on its traditional territories in Denende, Northwest Territories. Glenn, he's going to be coming up and introduce our speaker to, you, to us. Well, this is a surprise. <laughs> um, I wasn't told that I was going to introduce uh, Robin, so I'm just going to speak from the heart. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, <laughs> Robin Minard. Um, she's a friend and a colleague. Uh, we've known each other for a few years now, and uh, she's here to speak with another fr or uh, speak on. Um, her text uh, with another good friend of mine, Leanne Bet or, uh, Simpson, um, Rehearsals for Living. It emerged out of um, the friendship that we had collectively uh, forged, um, when was that, 2019? 
uh, when the Chinta uh, Center for uh, Research and Learning hosted a solidarity uh, gathering on my uh, home territories uh, just outside of Yellowknife. And the idea was that um, rather than meeting in institutional spaces, or bars, or in the in the trappings of a city, that we would uh, we would gather a bunch of comrades. I saw Harsha was uh, here, and she was there as well, and uh, just uh, let the land kind of uh, serve as the the backdrop instead of instead of um, these these institutions, and hopefully that it would um, prov provoke different types of conversations and solidarities. And out of that um, um, meeting, I guess, or, or collaboration, uh, we just came with a couple of simple questions, and that was uh, to uh, what were the projects that you were working on, and in uh, what ways could we, we each uh, support uh, you. It was hosted by my communities, it was, or by my community, it was on the land, and, uh, and uh, we just met uh, for a few days over, over, uh, over some country food um, and the fire and, uh, and um, this wonderful friendship came to be. Um, Robin is a prolific writer and activist. She, um, her first book, Policing Black Lives, had a formative impact on myself um, and on my new work and, um, and uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, I'm going to turn it over to Robin for her, her talk, and then we can continue this conversation uh, once I've jotted down a few notes and I'm a little bit more prepared. But I'm, <laughs> but I'm uh, very happy that Robin's here, and uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, and Robert Minard. Hi, thanks for that introduction, Glenn. <laughs> you did great. Um, I was wondering if when you opened the computer you were Googling my name. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's really, really great to be here tonight. Um, thank you so much to Samir, to Huyen, to Harinder um, for inviting me, for hosting me, for the labor that went into this, to the many email back and forths uh, that went into trying to organize a talk through the course of a long forever pandemic. Um, I am really honored to be here tonight to give this lecture in particular, in particular uh, Professor Chin Banerjee, who I never had the honor of meeting. Um, Professor Banerjee, but so many comrades uh, that I know and around me have taken such important inspiration from him. Um, I'm actually gonna wear a mask, you never know. Let me know if you can't hear me. When our fellow freedom fighters join the ancestors, they leave us with a duty, a duty that comes to those who came before, um, to those who are still li li living and dying under the ravages of injustice today and to the generations to come to commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to struggle. So I was thinking, being asked to host this particular, being asked to give this particular lecture, this historic you know, inaugural lecture of such an important figure about what it is asked of us to be anti-racist in these times. And it's, enor it's an enormous undertaking. Racism quite literally structures every aspect of our lives, our work. It's embedded into the planet that we live on at this time and the air that we breathe. We're living in the midst of a climate catastrophe, of a pandemic, of a decades-long crisis of police killing of black, indigenous, and racialized people, of mass incarceration of our communities, of poor communities, of uh, people living with mental health issues and disabilities, of a border regime that is leaving people seeking refuge from poverty, militarism, neoliberalism, and increasingly uh, global heating to die in deserts in the Mediterranean Sea at the US, Canada, and US, Mexico border. So it's an enormous mantle to take up, to live in these times, to be anti-racist in a planetary sense, and to struggle to work to create a livable world and a livable future. I think we're all faced with moments of overwhelm and of despair when we think about what this entails. Um, what I describe in the book with Leanne as, uh, you know, getting caught doom scrolling the multiple crises of our time, it can be immobilizing, right? But at the same time, outside of media attention, uh, except for perhaps of 2020, you know, we're living uh, in an incredibly exciting time of movement work, 
from land defense to work to get police out of schools, out of our cities, and out of our lives. I want to give a shout out to Defund 604, who I know, among others, was part of a protest today at 4 p.m., uh, working to really push policing out of what it should mean to govern the city of Vancouver. Um, we're living in an exciting moment of, a possible, of the possibility of mass regularization for non-status migrants, which is you know, the result of generations of anti-racist struggle, of migrant justice struggle. Um, and we have an entire generation of young people who lived through the last few years of historic protest, growing up to believe that the status quo is not necessary, that capitalism, police, and borders are not permanent, natural, or unchangeable, that another world is both possible, and to use Walter Rodney's words, necessary. George Jackson, incarcerated black revolutionary and freedom fighter, murdered by the state at the age of 29 in San Quentin, wrote these words from prison before he joined the ancestors. Settle your quarrels, come together, understand, that the, reality of our situ understand the reality of our situation. Understand that fascism is already here, that people are already dying who could be saved, that generations more will live poor, butchered half-lives if you fail to act. Do what must be done, discover your humanity and your love in revolution. So his words bring a lot of things to light, the urgency of the present moment, but at the same time, the necessity and the possibility of the present moment, and maybe capturing some of the fullest and most expansive ways of what it means to really challenge racism, what it really means to be anti-racist in a world currently structured around the enduring power of race to determine who lives and who lives well and who does not have access to a life. I think often that we are straddling these overlapping and simultaneous realities, the one that we live in, that leaves so many humans and non-human beings condemned to unnecessary suffering, people dying who could be saved, and at the same time, an awareness of the world that is possible, the worlds that we are creating, the possible ways of living and world-making that we have inherited from previous generations of freedom dreamers. So it's thinking with all of these issues that I'm gonna talk about three things tonight. what it means to be living at what some call the end of the world and resituating this concept of apocalypse. That will be the first part. The second part, I'm going to think about the end of this world and what it means to wage a defense of living. And then I'm going to turn to think about the respiratory cilia for a model of collective life and governance. And I'm going to intersperse this with some readings um, from rehearsals as we go through, as I think it's sort of one of the ways that helps me weave through these themes uh, the most. So I'll begin with the first part. And then Glenn and I, we're going to leave some time because we want to be able to have a conversation together before, before we do a Q&A. So I want to begin by resituating and re-engaging the end of the world. And I'm going to start with a reading from the opening letter of my first letter to Leanne, of the first letter that became the book that is now called Rehearsals for Living. Dear Leanne, about five years ago now, I sat down with a copy of your book, as we have always done. I'd planned to flip through the first few pages over my morning coffee. In the end, though, I stayed put, reading almost the whole text in one go, and was suddenly overcome with a strong feeling that I wanted to know you. Your words beckoned me to join you in what you called constellations of co-resistance, constellations that affirmed life and world-making in a time of acute racial violence. I am writing you a letter at the end of this world. From Cyclone Idai in Malawi, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, to Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, the devastating forest fires displacing indigenous communities from the Amazon rainforest through to the Miskogamang Ojibwe Nation in Northwest Ontario, our respective communities, that is, black and indigenous communities, are collectively positioned on the very forefront of the unfolding catastrophe. It would require a deliberate obfuscation to view the racially uneven distributions of harms that the climate collapse engenders as accidental. Even if we didn't take into account the melting of Arctic ice caps, rising seawaters, and eroded shorelines, desertification, and species extinction that are now nearly, if not totally, inevitable, the reality is that not only are an array of world endings already before us, they have already arrived. Our respective communities have borne already multiple apocalypses that were inflicted upon us, if unidentically, from the barbarity time of genocide, slavery, 
settler colonialism. The apocalypse is imagined, after all, in most classic Euro-Western settler tropes, in terms of the lack of clean drinking water, the destruction of the places that we, they, live, the poisoning of the earth, inhumane and restrictive responses to people left hungry, displaced in desperation. This is a condition that is already deeply familiar to our kin across Turtle Island and globally. You wrote this in on Dancing on Our Turtle's Back. By 1822, when many Anishinaabeg in the north and west were still living as they always had, we were facing the complete political, cultural, and social collapse of everything we had ever known. My ancestors resisted and survived what must have seemed like an apocalyptic reality of occupation and subjugation in a context where they had few choices. To remix Public Enemy, Armageddon been in effect. It is the apocalypses of slavery and settler colonialism that bind our collective pasts and presents together in the calamity at hand. Today, the racially uneven environmental catastrophes of the present are inextricably connected to the unfinished catastrophes of 1492, the two genocides at the heart of the Americas, to paraphrase M. Norbessi Philip, when a death-making commitment to extraction and dispossession took hold on a global scale. As we are confronted with the crisis of the Earth's viability then, amid so many crises, I am writing you so we can think together about what it means for us to live buildable to build livable lives together in the wreckage. So this is the starting point of the book, the letters that turned into a book, the climate crisis, racial capitalism, genocide, ecocide, and settler colonialism as a kind of apocalyptic world endings that com many communities have lived through, that other colonized communities have lived through as well for 500 years. It's the important part of um, what I'm trying to bring out here is how to understand that the long history the long histories of slavery, settler colonialism, colonialism and racial capitalism that have actually led us to the catastrophes at hand. So I think all of us are always trying to break things down for those of us who have kids in our lives, whether they're you know, bio or community children, of how to explain the context that we're facing now in terms of the climate, right? So I often talk to my son Lamar, who's now seven, letting him know, you know that the earth is sick, we have to do what we can to try to take care of it. Um, but it's so easy to say, when they say, how did this happen? You want to say, well, we made a series of terrible mistakes. We, um, you know, we've poisoned the planet by guilt, by, by greed, by accumulation. But it's so important to correct ourselves uh, if we want to teach our children the right lessons, right? Because it's not humanity that has poisoned so much of earthly and non-human life. But it's been, it, it is and has been a small and very powerful minority of humanity in the order that they've imposed on earthly life. So when we say human did this, we're both erasing the real authors and the first victims of the crimes enacted on planetary life. And this is sort of one of the many parenting moments um, that sits with me as I try to make sense of the present moment. So I think for ourselves, for our children, and for one another, it's necessary to move beyond this idea that human-related activities are at the cause of where we're at. So who is we, right, when we say we did this? Um, the IPCC, the Interplanetary Panel, they're the ever... I wish. <laughs> One day. <laughs> I watch a lot of Star Trek and I'm ready, but not yet. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate is the United Nations body for assessing the science related uh, to climate change. And they describe the moment when anthropogenic um, activities began to shift in crucial ways the natural environment leading to the, he the heating catastrophe of the, of the present. So Anthropocene means age of humans. But humans have been on this planet for 200,000 years as, as humans, right? And more so uh, in our, in our, if we think about you know, our ancestors, right? So the period associated with the world's, world's carbon production expanding so massively as to impact the state of the planet and what lives on the planet is traced by most accounts to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution did not emerge from humanity. Capitalism is not 200,000 years old, right? The Industrial Revolution emerged from Europe and its settler outposts. The climate crisis is tethered to its origins in slavery and colonialism, genocide and capitalism, and it's important that we name that. I'm not thinking alone here. There's a lot of different ways of this, that this reframing can happen. Catherine Yusuf calls it a billion black Anthropocenes um, Francois Vergès asks that we think about it as the racial capitalocene as opposed to the Anthropocene. Um, South African eco-socialist Vishwas Satgar calls it imperial ecocide. 
And this is a way of insisting that ecocide accompany the racial violence of genocide and slavery. He uses this term to capture the fact that the economic systems of slavery and colonialism and capitalism were accompanied by planned and unplanned destruction of the earth and to previous ways that it had been cared for and tended to. The Industrial Revolution was fueled and made possible by the violently coerced labor of kidnapped Africans on land from which indigenous populations had been murdered and forcibly removed. Glenn's work has been extremely helpful for helping us think about the history of land dispossession and history in, in relation to the history of capitalist accumulation. So if we, as our Lord writes, were never meant to survive slavery and colonialism, not, she clarifies, as people, neither were many of these discardable places on which kidnapped Africans labored, right? Often indigenous land cleared by, cleared by genocides upon which the Industrial Revolution was built. In 1944, uh, Trinidadian freedom fighter turned prime minister, um, Eric Williams described in his magnum opus, Capitalism and Slavery, how by the 18th century, Barbados was already, and this is his words, suffering from the inevitable consequences of slave labor and quick extraction of profit from the soil. So the island of Barbados, this is where my family uh, is from, uh, was a slave plantation, much of which was monoculture in terms of a, a sugar plantation. Um, the, the, sugar, the sugar cane crops. By 1663, the physical environment of this colony was already described as decaying fast due to soil exhaustion. Planters knew about the environmental impacts at the time, um, but it was understood to be the most profitable method. So this is a mode of production and a way of thinking about the earth and the people on it, right, of how profit is made. Speaking about the state of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson said, we can buy an acre of new land cheaper than we can manure an old one. So this is an epistemological stance um, in a really important way, as much as it is a mode of production, right? And of course, enslaved people in the slave colonies were worked literally to death, right? We're talking about life expectancies well under 30. So again, we can see a particular logic of, um, you know, accumulation in which there's no value to, to, to life, right? To lives that are not those of white, wealthy Europeans. Black people were treated with the same disregard as the soil they were forced to labor on worked literally to death while positioned as an exploitable source of energy, while indigenous communities, when considered at all, understood only as a barrier to access to the land. Europe's, Europe's and North America's industrial revolution was accomplished by thiefing our ancestors' collective lives, labor, and lands, and transforming them into capital. There's a great uh, quote by Franz Fanon that I think really helps bring this into view, particularly, I'll just read it for you. European opulence to which I would add North American opulence, is literally scandalous, for it has been founded on slavery, it has been nourished with the blood of slaves, and comes directly from the soil and the subsoil of that colonized, underdeveloped world. And we can think about this in terms of the colonization of Africa as well, right? The desertification of the Sahara, the salinization of the Niger Delta, deforestation and soil degradation caused by monocrops, these were these were imposed most harshly on lands that were not going to be settled, not intended to be settled by Europeans. In a time where Nigeria is facing the worst decade of flooding and several African island nations, Mauritius, Cape Verde, Seychelles, are slated to face flooding and possibly disappear, right, and eventually underwater as sea levels rise as a result of climate change. So it's not a metaphor or an abstraction to say that the violence of slavery, settler colonialism, all colonialism and capitalism were world endings and harbingers of the world endings to come, and some of which are arriving presently. So can we say humanity, or can we turn to a powerful minority of people again, and a racial ecological economy of worth that has been mapped onto the, the, the globe's inhabitants? The climate catastrophe was born not from mankind, but from the slave plantation, the settler town, the prison, and the reservation. So the horrors of this moment, I think, is so important, again, to take back from this we that we might accidentally teach our children. The horrors of this moment have authors, past and present. Their names have been Christopher Columbus, Lloyds Bank, Imperial British East Africa Company. Today, they have names Enbridge and Barrett Gold, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Dakota Access Pipeline. The horror stories of our times is being written in the boardrooms of Wall Street and Bay Street in the London, New York, and Toronto stock exchanges. Toronto, where I live, and I'm visiting from at this time, really loves to talk about itself as a global city. And yes, it's very global in terms of the large populations of black um, and brown folks from everywhere, you know, colonized people, again, coming, coming to the metropole, right? There's a large diversity of people, but it's global in more than one way, because ap approximately 50% of global mining is traded in the Toronto Stock Exchange. 
you know, Canada is, of course, home to more than 75% of global mining companies. Um, and we need to remember that what this really links to world endings elsewhere, right? For indigenous peoples in the Wet'suwet'en territory, to the Niger Delta, to Belo Sun, where a Canadian-owned company is trying to open the world's largest open pit mine. You can see gas flares from space, both from the Niger Delta and from the Amazon uh, when it's burning, right? So thinking back to the diverse and global cities that we, where we live in terms of the real devastation and ecological human um, and environmental being raked elsewhere. So there's a part of the book where I walk through the city of Toronto and just map out the place where the mining headquarters connect to the global locations on which we are de they're devastating indigenous Af and African peoples, their lands, their livelihoods and futures. But you could do the same walk in downtown Vancouver. So Visachitas project is owned by Vancouver-based Los Andes Copper and is located in the Puta Putaendo Valley in the Valparaiso region of Chile. This project is currently in the exploration phase, but it's working to develop a massive copper mine whose open pit would sit right atop um, a river, which is the main source of fresh water for downstream indigenous communities. There's a group called Putendo Resist, which is a group organized against the project since 2015, concerned about the project's high water use and impact on the region's ecosystem, on the wetlands, and over 100 rock glaciers. So again, there are authors of the apocalypse is being, wreck being wrecked on peoples at this very time. It's not only a history that we have inherited. Trevally Mining Corporation, also traded in Vancouver, um, is based in Burkina Faso and has now reported that eight miners who disappeared after catastrophic floods at a mine last April had been found dead, right? Um, all had been found at level 580 of the mine where significant amount of debris and machinery had accumulated according to the company. There's a strong pushback, but again, there's no accountability for so much of the violence being enacted on the world that is based right here, very tidily out of sight. In the poor air quality and forest fire marked skies of the present that we're living in, I know the air quality here um, is at this very moment um, you know, filled with dangerous particles. We're also bearing witness to the unfinished catastrophes of ecocide and genocide, right? So when I opened, I said that racism is embedding itself into the planet and into the air we breathe, and that's actually true in a very literal sense in this time, given that these atrocities are still being written. So we're haunted with the world ending violences committed against human and ecological life, both from slavery and settler colonialism past and ongoing um, projects of neoliberalist and global capitalism at the moment. And this is apparent in the land around us and in the air that we breathe. So today's landscape and the, uh, the sometimes unrecognizable skylines also stand as an indictment of Western civilization writ large, right? You can see the ways in which a society is foundationally harmful in the ways that we're not even able to actually breathe clean air through our lungs in this moment. So now I'm going to move on to the second part, which I think follows important necessarily from the first, um, because as I said, I don't like to be immobilized with despair, but it also is important to do an accounting of the what and the how we have arrived to where we have. So I wanted to call this part in defense of the living. I also wanted to call it there are some world endings I'm comfortable with. So um, my dear friend and comrade next to me, Glenn Coulthard writes, um, for our nations to live, capitalism must die. Red Nation remixes and expands on Glenn words and writes, for the earth to live, capitalism must die. Right, so this is thinking about the ends of some worlds that may be necessary. So I'm gonna open this section as well too with a short reading. All world endings are not tragic. There are some world endings I'm comfortable with. Some versions of this world need to end and indeed should never have begun in the first instance. Some worlds, after all, depended on the ongoing, violent, always racial and gender differentiated foreclosures of other worlds. We need to have the courage to envision the end of this world, that is, the world that white supremacy built, to move forward toward futures that are premised on life rather than human, ecological, animal and microbial waste. This disruption is what Frantz Fanon was getting at when he wrote in The Wretched of the Earth that decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is obviously a program of complete disorder. Disorder is not the same as chaos. It implies instead a radical rupture from the dominant order, which is after all murderous. A program of disorder implies here that we radically alter and indeed breach entirely with the current order of things and the global violences upon which this order relies. 
We are engaged, I believe, in asking one another, what does it mean to try to build worlds that affirm rather than destroy life? I believe that world ending and world making can occur, are occurring, have always occurred simultaneously. Given the racial and ecological violence are interwoven and inextricable from one another, now more than ever, black and indigenous communities who are globally positioned as first to die, this is the words of BLM UK, as they disrupted um, a plane that was about to take off, uh, really calling out you know, Britain's involvement in the climate crisis and the global violence is again being enacted on African peoples, uh, first to die within the climate crisis. We are also on the front lines of world-making practices that threaten to overthrow the current death-making order of things. This is, after all, the radical promise, if as of yet unachieved, that was and is extended to us by the world-making projects of abolition and decolonization. So what I'm trying to get at here is that it means something to be the descendants of survivors of multiple apocalypses. It means something to come from traditions of past radicalism that allow us to breathe new worlds into the present. Because of course, as I said, capitalism is not 200,000 years old. Before this mode of production, there were countless other ways of relating to one another and to this earth. I wanna share the opening lines of a poem that I love um, by Lucille Clifton. She says, being property once myself, I have a feeling for it. That's why I can talk about the environment. And these words to me highlighted the way in which black liberation and the projects of abolition is intrinsically tied to ecological justice. So being property once myself, I have a feeling for it. That's why I can talk about the environment. There's a particular history here, right, of black women's bodies um, as a commodity that were under, meant to produce more commodities. And the environment, too, was made the same thing, right, under, um, under both the economy of slavery and capitalist modes of production. So there's this tension between having lived and being made a commodity and disposable and surplus life, but also coming from histories and epistemologies of otherwise possibility, right? That's why I can talk about the environment. That's not to say I am um, only something to be accumulated. The environment is, but it's about two different kinds of being that, were, that had a, per, a certain epistemology imposed, but of course hold so much more than that, right? It's also coming from histories, ontology, and as epistemologies of otherwise possibility from long-standing traditions of communally ordered life, land orderings um, that precede vastly the history of racial violence that we find ourselves in the last 500 years of apocalyptic um, world governance. So rather than being understood through a sort of racist lens, as you know, more primitive and close to the earth, I'm not forwarding an essentialist understanding of race that says that black women or black people or indigenous people you know, as certain kinds of logics would say, have us as closer to nature because we're further from civilization, right? So that's not what it means to say, that's why I can talk about the environment, right? But if we understand the way that radical traditions are passed down, to be able to talk about the environment because you too have been made a commodity, because we have always understood that we never were, even if we were positioned as one, and neither was land, right? Until very recently in human history. So environmental justice is often understood as a kind of white issue, and because of that, those believed to be its leaders um, are not always under, um, have the, the struggle, right, to, to think about what it means to create a livable planet as not necessarily tied to the struggle against racial capitalism and, of course, the police and prisons and border systems that maintain this, this way of ordering the world. So recycling, personal choice, getting rid of plastic straws, um, these become these individual solutions to a systemically organized crisis. This being true even as indigenous Afro, Afro-Indigenous communities um, of the Garafuna peoples in Honduras, of the Wet'suwet'en folks on the front line of struggles here are in fact arrested for defending the line as the real environment, as the real environmentalists are gathering at conferences at times, right? So there are radical histories of the ways that black peoples globally um, have a unique historical relationship to the struggle over land. And that's what I was trying to kind of bring out with, these, with Lucille Clifton's words against environmental racism and land defense. So we are black, indigenous, and so many other historically dispossessed peoples steeped in histories and ways of knowing that are to think with Aimé Césaire, not only anti-capitalist, as in prior to capitalism, but anti-capitalist, right? Uh, so preceding capitalism and also anti-capitalist. There have been other ways of organizing and tending to life, land and governance, which preceded and many of which will outlast the barbarism of the last 500 years of the Western political order. 
but the afterlife of property continues to impact how black struggle is understood in relation to the planet, right? So once not enslaved African women's reproduct reproductivity uh, had us understood as progenitors of criminals, right? Uh, once children were no longer considered commodities, they were considered possible criminals, needing to, and black women's bodies then needing to be controlled by the state. But today, this often happens under the language of the white so-called um, eco-conservationists -cons uh, with undertones of eco-fascism where overpopulation, often focused on African women, right, is positioned as a threat, a threat to the planet from Donna Haraway to the Gates Foundation as now creating, again, um, you know, the people who will overrun who overrun the planet, whose bodies need to be controlled. Being property once myself, I have a feeling for it. That's why I can talk about the environment, so we can see how this is still very much resonant in the present day. But we have always had other plans. So perhaps black women and black folks are a threat, but not in the way that it is framed, right? Not in the way that it's a threat to planetary life. Not in creating criminals or surplus populations, but because black feminist, black anti-colonial traditions actually undermine and subvert a certain world order of racial colonial capitalism, um, you know, retrenched by carceral controls because of this organizing on the front lines globally against imperial ecocide. African anti-colonial black people of all genders um, have been building worlds beyond capitalism, beyond nation state, emerging from one standing traditions of doing so. So black radical struggle forges and maintains a multitude of alternative, non-exploitative relationships to the land beyond and outside the brutalities of capital protecting ecosystems, um, and the earth is at the forefront of many black struggles in North Preston and Nova Scotia, on the Honduran North Coast in the Niger Delta of Nigeria, where the Ija Youth Council worked in 1999 to forward an environmental awareness campaign called Operation Climate Change. Tanzanian independent leader and anti-colonial nationalist, Julius Nayere, uh, stated that the foreigners introduced the concepts of land as a marketable commodity to indigenous African societies in lands that came to be deemed Tanzania. Um, Thomas Sankara also explicitly tied African revolutionary struggle to thinking about uh, land. At the Silva Forest Foundation's first international conference in Paris in 1986, he was talking about the encroachment of the Sahel Desert in Burkina Faso, which was itself, again, the result of mass colonial plunder and deforestation. And he says, and Tarsha, you, you, you have this in your book as well, this quote I noticed when I was rereading it recently. Um, the struggle to defend the trees and the forest is first and foremost a struggle against imperialism because imperialism is the arsonist of our forest and savannas. So black women, black people have been at the forefront of, of land defense from South Africa um, where, excuse me, sorry, we're in South Africa, we're under the name Sikala Sonke, uh, women led support for the 2012 miners against the British-owned um, platinum mines in South Africa's mineral energies complex at Maracana. They're taking aim at the London Company, but also at the World Bank, right? So tight, fighting against intolerable labor, labor conditions and the massive ecological destruction wrought by finance capital and the extractive industry. So here we're on the, uh, we're on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and we're accompanied by brilliant um, Dene scholar Glenn Coulthard. So we're steeped in these histories and presence that tell us there are other ways of organizing the world, other ways of organizing land, other ways of organizing life under original stewards uh, that proceed and inform the present and future of what is possible. It's clear that black and indigenous and many other struggles overlap in many crucial, if under-addressed ways in part of struggles that are both local and global in defense of the living. So people choosing life over senseless death, people are choosing life over senseless death, senseless, senseless death and destruction every day. Sometimes this is more visible, right? 2020 was the year of a major uprising in a broader arc of liberatory struggle, black folks, multiracial struggle out in the streets in defense of our dead and a demand for another way of organizing life after the killing of Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery in Canada, Regis korshinsky paquet Chantal Moore, Nicholas Gibbs. This emerged from immediately preceding the massive anti-colonial network in support of land defenders in Wet'suwet'en. Um, beginning here, but of course spreading into a network uh, across so-called Canada and more broadly. Every day, groups of parents, librarians, nurses, temp workers, ordinary people, tired of the horrors of the presence, come together to decide what kind of world they want to inhabit, and in doing so, join the chorus of freedom-making struggle in the ways that we can, in the nodes that are possible and apparent to us. 
So we were and we are out in the streets in community centers and neighborhoods demanding abolitionist futures, anti-colonial futures, the ends of policing, prisons and borders, and in defense of living and healthy communities and a healthy planet. Black, in, black and indigenous liberation, other anti-colonial struggles, rebellions and collective refusals are interconnected and interlocking projects necessarily, right? Projects or, oriented towards life, the human, animal, ecological, micro, bi, micro, microbial life forms on this planet. As Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, where life is precious, life is precious. So the question of our time, for those of us who choose to be anti-racist, is how do we choose life and living over death-making institutions? So for the last part of what I wanted to say today, before we take some time to chat, is to think, to sort of scale inwards more, to think about a model of collective care. And for this, I'm thinking about the respiratory cilia. I spoke a, bit, a, little, a little bit just now about reconceiving world endings about what it means to struggle in defense of the living and these kind of larger movement histories that inform our presence. Um, you know, the movement in anti-colonial struggle against imperial ecocide, against racial colonial capitalism, these bigger ways that people have tried and are trying to build new worlds. And now I'm gonna scale down to a small model of how to think about what it means to act in the service of life. So just to reground, you know, we can't breathe at this time. Our ability to breathe is mediated by race by geographic location, by class, in a pandemic whose impacts are experienced so disproportionately by black and indigenous communities, by working class communities, attacking our lungs, among other body systems. The wildfires actually cause the respiratory cilia um, inside of our respiratory system to become inflamed. So this is the first line of defense that actually prevents dust and smog from entering our airways and our lungs. And this has actually exacerbated the risks of COVID-19 because the pulmonologists, um, pulmonologists have described how the cilia are often the first to succumb to the attack launched by the COVID-19 virus. It first attacks the upper respiratory tract entering through the nose or mouth and then zeroes in on the cilia. So we're living in a moment we can, where many of us can hardly breathe. And of course, I'm, rec I'm also referencing the words of Eric Garner among the last words he spoke, I can't breathe after the, as the police squeeze the life from his body. So where police prisons, environmental destruction, and unmitigated pandemic illness is squeezing the life out of black, indigenous folks, so many others, as well as the remaining forests, clean water, and ride, wide array of flora and fauna on this planet. I think here about the respiratory cilia too as a model for what could be, a model for collective livingness over and against a world premised on senseless destruction. That the very mechanisms that give us life and provide a model for care so the last thing I'm gonna do before we move on to the discussion is to leave with a reading from what is my last letter to Leanne. But I'm gonna have a sip of water first. There are times when I forget to connect with the fact that I inhabit a body that I'm not separate from my own flesh. Yet through my desire to protect the respiratory cilia in all of their complexity and fragility, I discovered a renewed ability to reconnect with the corporeal sides of life, if vicariously, and thus began to truly examine what it meant to care for myself. The respiratory cilia allow us, under normal conditions, to breathe clearly. They are tiny, tentacle-like structures, 1,000 times smaller than a human hair, that cover our respiratory tract. They are in constant motion. They move synchronously, 15 cycles every second. They are bathed in water-like fluid, and as the mucus layer on top of them traps debris, their rhythmic movements thrust it forward, away from the places where it could do damage. And from a visual perspective, the respiratory cilia are stunning. This is what first drew me in. I would close my eyes and visualize this movement that is constantly taking place inside my body, so essential to my health and survival, yet outside of my conscious awareness or control. How could one knowingly damage something this beautiful, this essential? We individually and societally continue to evade wellness, and so we continue to evade something that could approximate freedom. To think with James Baldwin, 
who highlights the confluences and consequences of these evasions. He says, privately, we cannot stand our lives and dare not examine them. Domestically, we take no responsibility for what goes on in our country and internationally for millions of people, for many millions of people, we are an unmitigated disaster." End quote. We cannot break away from that which we refuse to see. To break away, that does not mean that we abdicate pleasure individually or collectively, only that we call that which we know to be harmful. It asks that we affirm the necessity of pleasure too for the collective. The scientific community has not yet reached a consensus on the precise way that the respiratory cilia managed to move the mucus layer that lies over top of them. It is still subject to intensive research. In the videos I have seen, where the cilia are magnified and their movements slowed down, they appear almost sentient as they gently pulse backward and forward. Millions of tiny parts working together with what can only be described as graceful movements, all geared toward a singular and admirable task of preventing harmful substances from entering the lung. A practice of collective care toward the protection and the safety of the broader organism. To value collective livingness, to touch and know life fully, to know a life that is not in some way predicated and subsidized by the suffering of another, I suspect that this is what liberation is. I suppose we will find out, or maybe our children are theirs if we do enough with this moment. I suspect we are encountering not a single portal but a kaleidoscope of portals spanning our most intimate lives, our communities, the broader terrain of struggle. Every breach with the status quo counts is its own portal, lie by lie and town by town, even if we may not see, live to see the outcome. And of course, jumping through the portal, the portals asks of us that we, amend, that we assume an element of risk. It demands a certain sacrifice that we cannot know in advance. It demands the end of the safety that some of us have come to know, but safety is already over. And for some of us, it never arrived. There is work to be done. The long work of choosing life, wellness, of rebuilding the world. It will take all of us and so many more. So I'm making a toast to you, to the end of this world. I will breathe for you too. I am ready to grab your hand and jump through the portal. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk, uh, Robin. Um, I'm assuming that um, many of these people haven't or um, haven't yet uh, dealt into the text. So I just wanted to provide a little bit about an opportunity for you to get into the sort of background and what, what, uh, what prompted um, your approach. Um, part of it is because I'm so fascinated and intrigued by the way in which the book is fiercely critical in terms of the, in terms of the practices and structures and the worlds that we live in right now. Um, but it is uh, less so in terms of, or it's, it's, it's less pointed or it doesn't dwell on um, the often academic or, or fabricated differences between our communities. And it just kind of prefigures the world to come um, in that realm of critique. So it's direct and pointed in the one, um, one instance, but it's world building and prefigurative in the, in the other. And I was just wondering if you could um, speak, to, speak to that a bit. Sure. So maybe I'll speak to the first part of your question first and then the second part of it. So the first question is sort of how the process of kind of how, how it was conceived of early on, yeah? And how yeah. it sort of came to be? Yeah, so I'll sit like this so I can kind of answer and also talk to you at the same time. <laughs> It'll be worth it for me. <clears throat> so um, as you say, the book before it was a book was kind of part of a series of like communications and ways of trying to think together about what freedom might mean, right? So I think that when you're saying, you know, it's not, I think it's referencing many, like some traditions of academic uh, debate and literature, but it's trying not to get stuck in, stuck within that, because I think the primary goal 
with Leanne and I has always been like, how do we, what does it mean to get free, right? We're coming from, I think, communities and histories of radicalism for whom the biggest question is, what does it look like to live and how do we live together, right? So um, Leanne and I first met, um, she had invited me to be part of a talk. It was when both of our first books came out. In t well, my first book, one of her, it was like her fifth <laughs> or sixth or something. But so Policing Black Ives had just come out and as we have always done, had just come out and we met in this, on a stage pretty much at Sala Rosa in Montreal. And we had what was just our first real conversation at that time outside of one conversation on the phone when I was in a subway and we were <laughs> loosely making a plan. And from that moment, we were so much talking I think never trying to make comparisons or analogies, right, between what it means to be a black woman in this world, trying to think, you know, as an activist, but as a scholar about, um, about collective struggle. Um, and I think that that kind of conversation, I think, was so generative, and, but had us leaving so many more questions for each other. So from that one, that first conversation, we were just like, well, we will now continue this in, in, a, in, a, multiple, in a multiplicity of different ways. So then when she invited me along with uh, Harsha and you know, the, the people who run the Freedom School in Toronto and many others, I think that was another moment when we could really convene, as you described, I think, so beautifully, right? On the land, again, not with a sort of set of research questions or any of this, right? But to really just sort of sit together. I remember asking you what was gonna happen and you really did say, you know, we're gonna let the land set the grounds for this. But what ended up being shared was just people's you know, political commitments and histories. I remember this really beautiful moment of watching the, the person running the Black Freedom School and the Indigenous Freedom School having this conversation about pedagogy and how they, how they teach the next generation, right? So again, it wasn't about sort of how do we conceive of freedom in a theoretical sense, but it was how do we do freedom, right? With our kids, with the people that we teach um, in the worlds that we're trying to make. And when her and I had began to write each other, I wrote, I had written her a letter but we definitely weren't planning to write a book necessarily. We were just kind of thinking this moment on the land had been one moment, this time in Montreal had been another, of how are the different ways we could sort of keep thinking through these questions that I think we were able to sort of be building off from one another over this time, right? And I think that if there hadn't been a pandemic, there might not have been a book because we might have just done other kinds of land gatherings. We were talking about what it might mean to go to Barbados. There are so many other, um, where my family's from, right? So there's just so many other ways that I think we wanted to sort of converge and commune together. Uh, this idea of thinking collectively as opposed to thinking as an individual is something that really appealed to me. Um, and, but in the, in the end, because it was a pandemic, because of the shuttering of the day-to-day, -day, we really ended up sort of you know, creating this world instead to live in through, through letters, as that was one of the only ways we really could be together. But um, you know, I also think that I kind of want to toss this back to you, if that's okay, because something that I think over conversations that we have had um, is some of the work that you're doing around the ways that black communities and indigenous communities have organized here across the border in ways that, you know, of course, we've always, you know, communi many communities, even within our communities, have always had, you know, difficulties and difficult histories, but I find academia sometimes zooms right in on that to the, to the detriment of many other things. But I think what you really brought to my attention is the ways in which Oh, so many anti-colonial struggles historically have always been, in many ways, multiracial colonized people trying to build a, you know, a life-affirming world in the context where we're all under the same barrel of the same gun, yeah. right? Or perhaps a different gun, but <laughs> the different barrel of a different gun, but nonetheless, like fighting for our lives out here. So I wonder if you might maybe want to talk, because I really see. I'm excited for your book to actually be out, because I feel that there would be so much. And that's not a dig. I'm just excited <laughs> to read it. <laughs> Um, and, you know, because I think that it would be an interesting conversation, really, right? Because it's about, um, about communing and about, that, and about that labor and about radical histories and, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I wish it was done, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lot slower than that. Uh, um, so it was actually kind of um, the, the instance that brought us together for the first time, like I mentioned through the land-based sort of experiment that we had done, has come out of a long history within the Dene Nation of internationalism and, mm -hmm. and learning um, particularly from each other through the travel of ideas, uh, but also the actual physical sort of solidarity efforts that, that our communities had in the past. So this came to me be, to be important because like when my first book came out, it came out on the heels of Idle No More, which as you know is like one of the largest 
indigenous mobilizations, at least in this country in the last 40 years. Um, but it came, it, it hit the shelves at the, um, with the, um, with the um, uh, real, uh, struggle of uh, black communities with Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so using Fanon in that first book and, and all this stuff, which was unsaid, just letting the theory kind of do the work, it came to me was wildly inappropriate and there should be a contextual sort of I, I, contextualization of, of these relationships as, as uh, uh, that gave birth to, to um, the ideas that came out in that book. And one of them was um, the Dene Nation sort of internationalism and this was grounded in like histories of tradition going back to Yamaja's travels across uh, the human and other than human world and establishing the right relationships right to uh, to the idea of uh, um, self-reliance becoming so integral to self-determination at the time which came from Tanzania um, which itself um, uh, filtered through Tanzania through the traveling theories of of um, the importance of, of uh, Mao at the same time or at the time so that was kind of that stuff, and then and then and then there's all the important activism that was going on in the uh, city of Vancouver with the Native Alliance for Red Power, and their uh, direct relationship with the Seattle Panthers, um, again um, championing like a a grassroots sort of uh, version of self-reliance and socialism that served as an anchor for their for their stuff. Now coming from Mao through through the Panthers. Mm -hmm. So it's just a way to, um, again, kind of like you're doing in, in, in your book, it's calling out a fucking world um, uh, destroying sort of present, uh, but not g dwelling on, on some of the academic or otherwise um, um, disagreements that we might have, real or otherwise, yeah. uh, but just showing uh, through storytelling or, or histories or theory building um, of the alternative ways in which, which we have uh, related to each other and, uh, and can relate to each other again, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just going through, because there's, the, there's this way and sometimes just thought about it as this new question, like what does it mean to be in solidarity? But I think mm -hmm. that history has showed us that we used to actually have better answers to that. <laughs> before, right? And like so much of anti-colonial struggle was people across the world, you know, black, brown, indigenous thinking together theoretically, but also like very, <laughs> in a very real way, even if sometimes things were, did not go perfectly, right? To try to literally end capitalism <laughs> and end racism in a global way and to try to build something else. And this is true in these really expansive um, freedom projects and also true in these small ways. And I was going through, um, you know, I've learned so much from black feminists in Toronto, so many of whom are just like Caribbean uh, lesbians who've been in that city for you know, been in the city for decades, like Beverly Bain's been organizing against police in Toronto from the 1970s, was part of the Grenadian Revolution, <laughs> you know, so there's this huge rich uh, history. When I was going through the Black Women's Collective, this like anti-capitalist black women's um, newspaper that was published in the 1980s, and seeing works published by Lee Maracle, by talking about, you know, the incarceration of indigenous women, right, and seeing the way that there's these long histories about when we're talking about the police, when we're talking about capitalism, like when we're talking about the places killing us, we are, we are, we've been there together historically, <laughs> are still there together now, quite literally, right? But at the same time, as you say, it's not only the in the structures, right? But it's in the movements against that and thinking together and organizing together um, in, in so many different moments, I guess, across history. So it's really exciting to see the way that we'll have, I think, this local and transnational vision that you're gonna be able to sketch us out from a really particular time. Yeah, and one of the, like, there's a couple of things like as an academic, I also think of like some of the discord or discursive sort of frames that cut against um, um, indigenous relationships to to a host of others, and one of them is kind of the notion of settler colonialism. So I told I talked to you about this a little bit, and it normatively privileges a very sort of exclusionary concept of land, like this land was ours, it was stolen and taken by X uh, populations. And, um, and then it privileges a concept of time. So it's like, we were here first. And I think that this text really breaks down some of those assumptions 
um, in that land is not like at all a commodified entity, which is either you belong to it or it belongs to us. Um, and you work through that, that um, in such a beautiful and incredibly important sort of way. I was wondering if, like I kind of can get um, Leanne's and the Schnabeg sort of conception of land, um, which is always something that is, that is uh, open to those who, who are in need of it. Um, but I was wondering if you could, you could uh, and this is based off of a text that I, uh, we were texting this afternoon, and I was like, the, when you get into um, what a land politics looks like, um, I thought that that was really, really, really breaking ground and kind of getting over some of the traps that the discourse of settler colonialism today, um, especially white settler colonialism, um, kind of fixes us into. Hmm. Uh, where everything is like, we're almost like a new, a new, or we're constructed as these proprietors and uh, everything goes through us, whereas that's never, never um, what was demanded or, or ought to be demanded, I think. Sure. See, I like this. I think that what you're setting up in a few ways is really exciting to me because I think one thing that I've learned from reading your work, from reading Leanne's work, from, you know, we also just from young queer indigenous organizers across these lands is the idea of, you know, something like land back isn't this sort of like white territorial like this is our land in the way in this in the settler colonial version of, of possessing a place, right? But the idea of land back is about pushing back the idea of land being property, right? So I think what you're um, and, you know, Leanne's work has attested to this in really beautiful ways. And she she really gets at this excitingly, I think, in rehearsals, too. But so what I was trying to think about it was like from thinking about it from like the global politics of black people though, right? So I was thinking about not just settler colonialism, but all colonialism. And <laughs> it could have been me, <laughs> but so we were trying to think, I was trying to think about, you know, what abolition, how you can think about abolition and land from a global perspective. And I remember watching this documentary it was while I was cooking something and then I got distracted and like put down the chicken I was cooking to write to Leanne because finally I had found the right words. But um, Usman Sembene, who is a Senegalese anti-colonial filmmaker, organizer, has this beautiful, uh, there's the documentary filmmakers are talking to him and they ask him some in question about the colonizers and he says, I might be paraphrasing here, but he says, the colonizers have never done anything, um, done anything to help the world be habitable. Everything they do is to destroy the land, right? And I think that thinking about the how much of land destruction was a process of the colonization of the, of the continent of Africa, period, right? That there's these connections between, yes, of course, settler colonialism and a certain kind of land theft, but the broader project of colonialism in the African continent, for example, was about forcibly removing people from the land, changing relationships to the land that people held communally often, right? Of course, there's multitudes of pre-existing societies that had different relationships. Um, you know, I'm not gonna speak for the continent writ large, right? But to say that there was so many ways of communal kinds of land ownership relationships of, that um, peoples had to land, to, or, to structuring that, that had both, you know, that were literally forcibly removed from the land, often placed into networks of prisons, um, you know, in prisons that were then built, modeled off of the slave ports in West Africa, you know, across the continent uh, to make this possible, right? So this question of abolition and the land, if you think about some of the policing of the global black world, right? And the prison networks that were set up was about this forcible land removal. So this isn't something that we're just mapping conceptually from say like settler colonial studies onto there, but this was part of colonial policy and practice more broadly, right? So if we wanna think about anti-colonial struggle from an African and from a Caribbean perspective, it was about often about reorganizing relationships to the land, right? Reorganizing relationships, uh, pushing back against private property ownership. So this anti-capitalist part, of trying to create new societies was about also rewriting relationships to, to land in this way that I think is pushing back against the notion that land not only again should be owned by white, uh, not just by Europeans, but that it could also be run differently. Of course, we didn't end up seeing a socialist continent, so that didn't happen even after colonialism, uh, right? Because we didn't win that. We didn't win, or like as Emma, Emma Eta Edu says, colonialism isn't posted anywhere, right? So we're still in an anti-colonial struggle globally. But um, I think that that rewriting of those relationships is so crucial. So at the same time, I think what I was trying to do is think about the history of, you know, how the carceral state, how policing and prisons have been used to, 
you know, not only in terms of land dispossession here, right, where we live, but at the same time, of course, yeah, the conscription and policing rela being related to stealing people from the land, but also just policing and brutalizing um, black folks, right, in this economy. But that, that, that's also true in, in, for example, in Haiti, right, where Canada was part of a coup d'etat with France, with the United States, of organizing against the Levelless government, which was going to reorganize uh, land differently, have free and cheap education, and all had, again, was rewriting this kind of relationship to what it could be. And not only was Canada part of overthrowing this democratically elected government, but, you know, Canadian public tax scholars are still going. Uh, but Correctional Services Canada, like who run our prisons, are there, right? The SPVM has been involved in sexual exploitation of girls in Haiti, right? So it's like, it's not abstract to say that the policing and the policing that we see here who's murdering black people in this country are also part of, of murdering black folks globally, but in part also to maintain a certain kind of relationship to land, relationship to property and capitalism, right? So. Yeah, that's one thing, like both out of your, yours and Leanne's contribution here, there's like no one can come out of reading this exchange or hearing about your friendship or how it started or, or the ongoing dialogue without understanding that there is no local without its global ramifications and vice versa. Like this is, has to be internationalist, even though it's like rooted in that freedom in place and place making sort of aspect. It reminds me, or that chapter reminds me of uh, like again back in the 1970s or whatnot, and it's, I think this is probably because um, property hasn't hadn't been ingrained in our in our communities to the degree it has uh, through things like the comprehensive land claims process. But uh, the Dene, uh, like in their anti-pipeline stuff, mm -hmm. um, felt obligated to the people of Nigeria because Shell was operating there and on our lands, but it was through our lands that was enabling the treatment of, of uh, Nigerians through, hmm. um, so if, 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 like, if it meant that our lands would enable a life uh, worth living there, then we would feel obligated as Dene people in order to, or to, to uh, <coughs> an adequate distribution, but we know that that's not the case because the corporations involved um, we're just wanting to hoard it for themselves. Mm -hmm. So it was through this connection to place that enabled the, like a wider understanding of one's place in the world and one's obligations to others. And then similarly with NARPsters here, um, Ray Bob and Lee Merkel had written this article about um, the, again, dialectical relationship between land struggles here and in the Middle East and, and vice versa. And they kind of um, saw the 70s oil crisis as the product of this um, imperial sort of hostilities in the Middle East, which required a safe place for investment, which was the Canadian North. So there's this dialectical relationship. And it was the, and it was the Dene that were, were um, um, uh, demanding that sort of redistribution. Hmm. And similarly, again, like in in uh, in the 19, I'm thinking in uh, the 1940s and late 40s up through the 60s, Port Radium Mine, which was a, a mine on the north shore of uh, Great Bear Lake, um, was extracting secretly um, uranium for the construction of Fat Man and Little Boy, which obviously went into uh, the destruction, like the genocidal destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end, or that ended World War II. And uh, the Dene didn't know this about it. They just knew that they were suffering from um, uh, enormous amounts of cancer from um, from their laborers that it was taking that, that shit out of the out of the Port Radio mine and then uh, transporting it down the Mackenzie River. And when they had learned about the destruction that again came from their land, um, they felt the need to um, reach out to. Uh, uh, to the people of Japan and offer a, uh, an apology that wasn't willfully coming from um, from Canada and the Canadian states. So it's this relationship between what happens here and what's happening there and uh, and the fruitful sort of ethics of solidarity and, and actual world building that they that they um, um, facilitate. So uh, I just wanted to thank both you and Leanne for, for putting up um, the question of an indigenous and black land politics as necessary for 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 solidarity on on, on both sides of 
of, uh, of the communities, so. Yeah, and I mean, as we're entering a time in which the land is increasingly poisoned at a scale that we've never seen before, right? Mm -hmm. I think this is gonna be, it's going to have to be at the forefront of our lexicon and at our movements if it isn't already, right? Because as we're shifting towards a time where perhaps now we can mitigate some of these crises, you know, I think that um, even in times where maybe it wasn't more apparent, I think that environmental racism has been some of the sort of language that we've talked about, the way that black people's land, you know, the. Um, not black people's lands necessarily, but sometimes, right? But the places that black people live being subject to land poisonings, but that, as, that's, as that increases, I think it's going to be really at the forefront of what it means to think, to think about our struggles. And that's why it's kind of an exciting time uh, to be going back through some of those movement histories and some of those ways in which I think we're so presentist sometimes. And it's like we ask as if we have to solve these questions for the first time, but what your work I think is gonna really help us all to do what I was trying to do a little bit in, in rehearsals is to look back to the kind of freedom dreams of other ways people actually tried, yeah. right? Because I think we sometimes forget that, you know, we can look at the failures of, of the anti-colonial struggle in some ways, right? In terms of the ways that capitalism won, right? But I think that we need to remember that the freedom movements that we had were assassinated, right? They were actually very viable, had very viable visions for what the world could have looked like and how land could have been structured differently, how economies could have been life affirming and care oriented, non sexist, non racist, you know, um, beyond, you know, with free movement across the Caribbean, for example, rather than national borders with Haitians, you know, being violently excluded. From, from all over the Caribbean, right? That there are told, there were completely different visions for what that could have looked like um, that didn't come to be because of a world order that wanted to see other models of life extinguished, right? But they didn't fail on their own terms. They failed because, um, yeah, be, again, because they were assassinated, right? So I think it's helpful to go back through some of the other ways that those who came before us have actually tried and sometimes tried successfully for a moment, right? To reorient the world and to revisit those even and not to re, not to recreate them identically, right? Because we live in a different time, but to remind ourselves that again, we're coming from these long-standing traditions of saying no to this kind of violence. And as the as the stakes have never been so high, I think it's going to be a really important time for us to learn and relearn what those who came before um, can give us, and learn and relearn again how we're going to work together again in 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 a, in a time of crisis, right? To to reorient things before it's too late or even as it becomes too late and to continue to do that, you know, throwing water off the boat and again, just trying to do something else, something both old and new. Um, before turning it over to the audience, I just wanted to know, um, just because um, uh, I know you're both good friends of mine and I want this book to do well and I know that you've <laughs> been both traveling super um, a lot lately, uh, but also doing things independently for promoting this book. I was wondering if you could say, and this is partially kind of based on my own experience, it, uh, how it's received in different places. Like, is the reception in Canada uh, different than in the US? Is the reception different uh, depending on um, how much the black community comes out to support it or the indigenous community or mm -hmm. and what are some of the batshit crazy questions or, <laughs> or yeah. um I, like uh, how's it how's it being received and yeah it's so funny because we wrote this and we were like damn really i love to write you leanne like she likes to write me but we were like would anyone else want to read this <laughs> collection of letters, like we're both weirdos. There's a lot, it's political theory, but it's also, you know, it's about our kids. There's a lot of Star Trek references. Like there's so <laughs> many kinds of worlds that are in the book. So we were honestly, um, I remember when Dion Brand found out that we were writing the letters, she was like, send this to me, this is a book. And we were like, I don't, I don't think so, man. <laughs> Because again, we were just, you know, it's a kind of experimental project, right? And then we sent it to her and we were like, okay. Um, and then the more we then ended up with Knopf and the more people kept reading it, it seemed that even though we had built this sort of strange world ourselves, that there does seem to be um, different resonances in the, the different places that it lands, right? So I think that, you know, people who are interested in abolition and anti-policing um, who might you know be familiar with policing black lives, for example, you know, the abolition of police and prisons is a part of the book, and I think that those people seem to be finding that there. Um, we had like a really funny 
person who I will not name, but I'm like, people find, have found different things in it. Like one person was like, it's a book about two women and mothers writing across the pandemic, across the loneliness. And we were like, kind of, but like, it's very <laughs> political. <laughs> It's also about like getting rid of police and <laughs> much, much more. So we're like, this is a really strange version of the book. <laughs> um, and there was like some talk of like trying to get us on the cover of Shadow Lane, and we were like, I don't think <laughs> it's not that kind of book, <laughs> even if our sweaters are so beige. So um, you know, we were laughing <laughs> about that. But we are technically women and mothers. <laughs> we were writing letters across the pandemic distance, but you know, that's a vin minimal aspect of the content of the content of the book, right? So um, recently, well, I mean, we just found out yesterday it got uh, on the shortlist for oh, a Governor yeah. General's well, Award. Yeah. yeah, which is interesting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I wasn't just saying that to brag, but I was saying it because it was interesting because I remember when we wrote the book, we were like, okay. So once we knew it was going to be, be a book, we were like, well, we did write a book where we say that perhaps Canada as it stands should be abolished. We said, you know, it's a, it's a radical book. It's about reorienting the world. It's about anti-colonial struggle. So we were like, it's probably not an awards kind of book. That's okay. <laughs> you know, we wrote it to be legible, accountable to one another first, right? Then to our extended communities, you know, black indigenous communities, to the organizers, to movements, and then to who else ever may want to read it. So it was really surprising to get that. And I remember getting a form where they're like, do you want to, this is just yesterday, where they're like, you might want to get congratulations from different public figures. So would you share your address with like city councilors, the premier, the prime minister? And I was like, no, <laughs> not, at, not at this time. <laughs> you know, as we're organizing a demonstration for Monday, calling out the city councilors and the mayor. So I'm like, no, thank you. So it's interesting, right? Where, so I do think that people, I, this is all just to sort of say through many different anecdotes that it's a book that's about a lot of things, right? And I think that um, because it's about the climate catastrophe, because it's about policing and prisons and land and struggle, um, for, even though we wrote it in a way that we didn't know if that would appeal in a larger sense. I think that maybe maybe because it's letters, maybe because even though it's addressing so many really ser you know, serious issues in a, a pretty engaged way, but it's also kind of very personal and it weaves a lot of personal narrative through it. Maybe that's, there's something about the form that made this wild adventure that we sort of went on accessible beyond what we thought might just really be like us. <laughs> and maybe at best we thought would be like a zine at some point, right? So. I don't know why or how, but it does seem to be sort of finding a lot of different homes um, in a lot of different communities um, in ways that I would not have expected. But yeah, I have one, uh, just <laughs> again, before we turn it over to the community, I have one critical point to mention about the book. And it was the misrepresentation of uh, me on a- He tried to <laughs> drown us. <laughs> When we were on the land and we were going out to the island, it was uh, around April, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when you tried to drown us, <laughs> I didn't try to drown you, but uh, I was pulling everybody out. Uh, uh, we had big sleds where we were taking these people out to uh, to do the solidarity work that we were doing on the on the land. And where the winter road was, um, um, it's it's uh, snow plowed a bit, and so the sun, the spring sun. Uh, melts the water on that just a slightly a bit and I pulled over and I'm like uh, driving on this <laughs> and I think it was Harsha and, and everybody is like uh, there's water there's water we're gonna fucking go under and I'm looking back and I'm like oh okay I didn't realize so I just pull over on the on the uh, snow part again but I really 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 like when I went into this solidarity gathering I was like the best form of solidarity is not to kill your guests <laughs> Yes, and, and I, you know, you, we are still here. <laughs> and I just, uh, I think I just wanted that clarified, that you weren't in danger, although you could probably um, justify feeling like you were. You know, if you were surrounded by water and someone was dragging you in a snowmobile, as the water got deeper and deeper, you might suspect <laughs> that you might die. But we didn't, and lived to tell the tale, and now there is. Yeah, uh, and now... Glenn's been slandered permanently <laughs> in a book, he might, he might say, but, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Robin, and I'm sorry for fucking up the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's been 
it was wonderful. wonderful. As always, um, I think we should probably give the audience a bit of uh, opportunity to ask you some questions. Well, sure, sure, thank you. Thank you, Robin and friend, brother, for your discussion. I'm glad you mentioned Walter Rodney about the New World Order, and I, I worked with Walter Rodney wow. in Tanzania and with Nyerere. My question is, in, I work with uh, grandparents and grandchildren, and I'm always impressed by what grandchildren are teaching grandparents about environment and uh, uh, social justice and so on. My question is about the appropriation of the environmental movement, which is, which is quite energetic in many respects, especially among the grandchildren or the younger age group. But now the politicians and, and corporate leaders are also singing the same song, like a lot of anti-colonial struggles or anti-patriarchy struggles were appropriated. And uh, so do you, have any concerns about this appropriation of uh, justice-friendly struggles? Oh, yes. Thank you. I do. Thank you so much for that question. And, you know, thanks for sharing part of the sort of radical histories that you have been born witness to. Uh, that's always really exciting. But, um, yeah, I mean, governments, states, they will be appropriating, right? So um, I think that even if we think about the history of, ab you know, uh, abolition, which we can take to, you know, we can relate back to the abolition of slavery, right? Which if you think about what somebody like Frederick Douglass was insisting on in ending slavery, it was about ending systems of racial domination and racial violence totally, right? Being so critical, for example, even as the anti-Asian laws were being crafted after slavery had ended, right? That this was a project of human liberation to some under the terms of abolition. At the same time, the, like Britain literally used the term, you know, the idea of ending slavery and abolition to justify uh, the colonization of the African continent, right? It's literally written, um, you know, in, in some of those justification, right? So we always see uh, ways in which freedom movements are almost sort of immediately usurped and moved to reorganize violence under new terms, right? So I think that what is happening with the environmental movement is really important to, to look at this because of what's happening right now, because there's this greenwashing um, of, of you know, of supposed changes that are still very much within the realm of capitalism. And again, you know, to, to revisit what I'd said earlier, you know, for, for nations to live, capitalism must die. For the earth to live, capitalism must die, right? But to repurpose this towards capitalist um, ends, right? So we see, for example, they're building a new immigration detention center after there was a hunger strike several years back and they said we're going to make we're going to address we're going to address these issues they address the issues by making a new immigration center but they're going to make it lead efficient right they're going to have vines around the outside so it looks less like a prison from the outside right so we can see the ways in which they're literally trying to make like a green detention center right so we can see the ways that this language is quite literally co-opted to recreate and reorganize violence and injustice in human cages and caging, right? So I think that absolutely, we're always going to be contesting, um, you know, the terms, the terms that matter the most to us are those that are gonna be continually used against us. So I think what's important is to keep the precision of meaning, right? So because we need to be clear within our own movements and visions of what we're forwarding that you can't have any kind of green or eco-justice um, with capitalism. You can't have a greener cage and call that justice, right? So I think that it's really important to be really clear in terms of what we are fighting for and in terms of that vision. So when, there's a, when those attempted co-ops happen, and they will, they always will, right? That we have something that we will not be confused over and that the worlds that we're trying to build are clearly articulated. And I don't think we can control, you know, the way that states and corporations will continue to sort of try to do this, right? But I think that um, you know, like the, for example, 2020, that we, there was a very, a very well supported call 
all across North America to defund the police that way well over half of populations, uh, you know, of, of people supported, right, do support, that we could live, like, you don't need to spend $1.2 billion in Toronto on policing when people are literally, you know, dying in the streets homeless, right, that there's another vision that many people supported, but then the police are like, no problem, we'll keep the same funding, but we'll do more mental health training, right? And no, people were not out in the street for months on end asking for the police to pay themselves to do more mental health training, right? It was never about that. So I think that that reappropriation, we have to continue to call it out, but at the same time, we have to continue with the precision of the demands that we, that, that we did have because there is, it's because there's a power in it that it's being co-opted, right? So I think we have to keep that power and, and keep pushing back. Um, but that's sort of one way I would answer that question. Thank yeah, thank you. Maybe you have some comments on appropriation of indigenous struggles. I wrote a book on appropriation of indigenous <laughs> struggles. It all gets, yeah, it's like it's the trap when you, when you uh, are vying for recognition with the state, with the state within a capitalist mode of production. They'll respond to your demands by a watered down co-opted version. And unfortunately, over time, that that watered-down co-opted version is subject-forming, and it and kind of uh, bleeds into the struggle itself. So, like um, how Robin and Leanne insist um, through their pra the practice of their form of embodied critique, is it's a clarity and a kind of constantly taking back the terms in which. Um, um, your criticisms are, are watered down. It's not fucking um, uh, defund the police. Um, it's like abolish it. Like it's it, like just kind of making sure that 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 meaning remains uh, remains sharp in response to to the co-opted versions or versions of those demands that get handed back to you. I still remember when Nancy Pelosi and co were like wearing the kente cloth <laughs> and I was just like black Twitter is being so funny today because <laughs> I just thought it was like the best meme of people making fun of white liberals appropriating but then it and taking a knee and then when I found out it was true I, I just yeah. I literally laughed for so long because I was like we are so good at memes we did such a good job this time <laughs> and then it had really happened and of course this is exactly how it happens right this is how this is how it works it's is sometimes like so ridiculous that it's funny, right? But at the same time, you know, you stop laughing after it's like then the Toronto police chief is taking a knee, then Justin Trudeau is taking a knee, and then everyone is still refunding uh, the police and using the word safety to mean <laughs> policing in prisons, and you stop laughing because it's, it's so ongoing and it's so egregious. And you did write a really great book detailing specifically how this has taken up. Yeah, so. it's like the way in some which our, our forms of critique get kind of co-opted and then turned back into the status quo, and it's just remaining vigilant that that not be the case through practice rather than just discourse, I guess, but... Yeah. Any more questions, comments? I'm nervous walking up here, this is weird. Um, thanks for everything. Um, I just, I feel like we just talked about one institution, the police, and I just wanted to ask you guys about um, the university and the university's place and all this. Um, you've, the talk, a lot of the talk has been about academia and the I think formulations of incommensurability and kind of avoiding that in your in organizing is that fair to say? Like, you guys went to Dene Nation and you were able to organize and work together and think in sort of this para university space um, keeps you out of the academic thinking where there, there's just like knots you get stuck in, I guess. Um, and so, um, I guess my question is: the university as an institution seems like. Um, an elephant in the room, <laughs> literally. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure. I mean, the university is a site of radical possibility. It's also a literal hedge fund, <laughs> you know, at this time, right? So that's many, the place of many things. Um, I think that, I do think it's important to push back sometimes against anti-intellectualism. Like learning doesn't op only happen in universities, but it shouldn't be elite to be able to read and read widely and to talk about ideas, right? This should and could be something that is naturalized and is normal and is not um, 
so prestigious that it puts you in debt, that it makes you indebted for the rest of your life. So I think that knowledge production is extremely valuable. The way that it's been hijacked in an institution that is inherently capitalist is deeply problematic, right? So it's so interesting um, because, you know, I think that there's projects like Black Studies that, of course, there's, you know, not all of them have been taken up with radical ends, but it's, there's something that's really incredible about like, young black people getting to read Franz Fanon and Angela Davis and like really think about what freedom means and think about that together, right? And so much of really beautiful movement work, uh, like, you know, in the United States and Canada has been in and around universities, right? So like the Sir George Williams affair um, in Con uh, at Concordia in 1969, in which the university ended up being set on fire. There was, you know, a massive black student organized um, moment, right, that was like world historical, right, in which a lot of folks that there was, pro, there was solidarity protests in the Caribbean, right, so these are important places of radical struggle where we can become involved um, in really valuable movements um, against some of the more violent things that the university also represents, right, which is the global sort of reorderings of capital, so I think that it's not one place, I think it's a contested and con being an actively contested place all the time, so as much as we have these sort of disciplines that were birthed from radical struggle, like women and gender studies, black studies, indigenous stu studies, that you know are always a little bit co-opting, but at the same time, they're sites of really important radical freedom making. We also have, you know, entire dis disciplines often, like much of political science, not all of it, criminology, <laughs> <laughs> right, that are just sort of normalizing the kinds of economic violence that are totally routine and banal and taken as everyday in our lives. Criminology, in a lot of ways, is just sort of making normal the idea that a certain portion of people, black, are criminals, right, who need to be caged, controlled, policed, right? This is not as normative. It's built into some disciplines, right? So even as we can be um, as students and teachers, really grounded in radical epistemologies, at the same time, there can be people two orders down who are literally planning to recreate the kinds of systems that are like responsible for the deaths of, of our community members, right? So like the real world, we're all in there together <laughs> in a lot of ways, right? And it's really an important place. I think if you're in the university to struggle to make that a more liberatory place and not think about it as totally separate from the world, but to also think about the ways that universities are engaged in you know, displacing real communities in the cities that we live in, right, and gentrification and all of this. So to really think about it as a site of politics, and because of that, because it's a site of politics, you have to be sort of politicized in it, or you can be very politicized in it in all of these ways. So I don't know if you want to add to that, Glenn. Well, that was a pretty perfect answer. I would also, <laughs> uh, like the assumption or the critique that uh, also assumes that we, our labor is only, only focus on the university. Um, Robin's an exa excellent example on the diversity of the forms of labor that she um, puts in the world that are sometimes targeted uh, within, within um, like academic discourse, but a lot of it's through, through movement and, and groundwork. Um, a lot of my time is spent uh, redistributing money that I'm able to like <clears throat> get um, from the state to um, to keep people, um, elders and, and community members on the land, uh, doing doing that work instead of going to to work in mines or or what have you. So it's like I think that that's a um, an improper assumption is that uh, uh, because we um, use fancy words occasionally. <laughs> Um, means that that uh, that it's not abuse or or um, relevant to to struggles on the ground. Mm -hmm. And you know the Panthers studied, studied yeah. theory, uh, incarcerated black political prisoners studied theory, right? So as Bell Hooks said, theory is for everybody. These intellectual works, they're. The, you know, ones that are radically freedom oriented are for all of this, can inform struggles in really important and exciting ways. And it's frustrating that that is more accessible within academia, but again, I think that's an issue about democratizing knowledge, right? It's about democratizing access uh, and ability for all of us to be like as literate as we can in movement histories, um, in movement knowledge. Um, and that should never only be locked up to one particular place, but we should be trying to sort of spread that as far as we can. Yeah, and, and it and calls for a vigilance and a, like, uh, a, a subject position that's critical of these, these things. Like, 
like uh, vying for recognition within, within the idiom of property enforced by the state within the capitalist mode of production is probably going to have as much effect on me as I'm going to have on it. Um, but arguing uh, or uh, teaching youth or, or young adults or, or whatever through an institution of Indigenous studies is uh, likely to be more amenable to the types of changes that you want to make than, than uh, arguing over uh, that, the, that the state should, that should treat you as free nations rather, rather than um, uh, corporations. So. Mm -hmm. So it's just maintaining a sort of critical uh, uh, position on the work that you do. Yeah. I think it's also important to fight to make universities teach us what should be and ought to be considered knowledge, but is so often left out. So, you know, I, when I was going to university, what I was learning in my undergrad was ridiculous, right? It was preposterous. It was like histories of slavery where like sexual violence didn't exist, like all of this being taught by, you know, there, there was, we read maybe Fennell and almost no other black people. So I remember, it's like working on undergraduate, I dropped out midway through for like eight years because it was irrelevant, but I had these folders that go back in my computers that are like me also trying to read like Angela Davis, you know, all of these like black thinkers that I wanted to read, but I had to do it on my off time. And I have just like folders going back 15 years of me just being like, well, if I'm gonna read black writers, it'll be like a self-education project. And then I'll like write this thing about you know, about Heidegger, so I can, so I can go through this process, right? And like, no shade, but there, like Angela Davis, when she was writing from inside of prison about literally the nature of a capitalist society, this is theory, this is knowledge production. These kinds, this kind of knowledge deserves to be treated as knowledge, it deserves to be treated as theory. The kinds of movement theorization that we're seeing and this, that we saw in the streets in 2020, that's coming from deep intellectual work and it is intellectual work, right? So like we should, we need to fight uh, to make the work that is deeply intellectual, that, that is theory, that should be understood as the canon and fight to, and, and really fight that, right? Because you shouldn't have to be, you know, like so much of the knowledge that I have now that informs the work that I do was things that had to be like necessarily a side hustle, right? And it should be formative to what an education is and not something that you have to sort of teach yourself on the side, but then sort of keep out of the other, the other work that you're trying to do, so. Yeah, and um, that's a totally, different sort of take on the important work in the book is how, how theory emanates through a sort of lived sort of movement practice rather than in, in the uh, um, kind of ab abstract deontological sort of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, instigating and uh, stimulating our minds, particularly my uh, uh, mind. Sure. Yeah, uh, my name is Jay Birdie, and uh, I'm uh, uh, involved with one of the organizations called Chetna Association of Canada. And the work that we're doing is is is, uh, is uh, looking into the issues of caste system and caste-based, you know, uh, discrimination. And I was really intrigued, you know, when uh, you were discussing concepts such as uh, internationalizing the uh, solidarity, you know, and a number of other issues. And, and I was really also grateful that uh, you looked at and uh, you, you collaborated and looked at the uh, black and indigenous uh, issues uh, together. My mind was going to, to India, I couldn't help it, you know. And, and considering the population of India, which is about 1.4 billion and about more than 300 million people of India, and if you add Indian subcontinent, it's about more than 300 million people who are continuing to suffer uh, from caste-based discrimination. I was thinking, and, and the other point is that, is that with globalization, there's a lot of migration happening, you know, and we're seeing some of the practices that are happening in India are also happening, you know, in the US, England, and Canada. And uh, so, so, so part of my question is that as, 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 as academics, as, as, uh, as, as writers, has there been any thoughts or uh, interests in also bringing in and, folk and, and uh, uh, in, including in the conversations the issue of caste, whether it's happening in India or outside of India. Just, just wondering if, 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 if there's been any thoughts from your perspective or any ways of, of uh, including uh, caste-based discrimination. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. My question is also kind of similar. Sure. Take, take yeah. Sure. Okay, my name is Manjit. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Robin. 
Um, my question is also, I was similarly wondering, same as Jaiburdi. So um, it's like I can relate with the topic you were including in the book. I can feel that uh, um, struggle for the land, for indigenous and uh, identity for the black people. So similar way, I was also feeling the same thing, that how about the people uh, who are in India, they're outcast from the even caste system, untouchables. And there's, they're also dealing with the same kind of struggle. So I was wondering like how you relate uh, those people similar struggle in your like you know thoughts and uh, can it be also a part of uh, same because they are going through the same even like they are going through more maybe or same but how can they be related into the same uh, context of your book thank you so much sure I mean I wouldn't say that these things map onto each other identically so I always try to move away from sort of same but I do think that it's important to think about how violence is global, uh, global, local and global are connected, right? Are interconnected in really important ways. So maybe one of the ways I can try to think about that is, though our book is really specifically about, I think, you know, for me it's written from the perspective of a black feminist, you know, grounded here, but thinking in, with black, black struggles globally, but one of what we're really trying to struggle with, I think, is the idea of a world premised on racial hierarchization, right? and the different like allotment of, of human worth across races. And I think what you're trying to point out is the way that this also happens across, across um, caste, right? So I think that, I guess that what, what, what I think you're pointing out is that there are many different ways in which like hierarchical or ways of organizing human worth are violent, are causing certain people to be cast aside and being experiencing particular kinds um, of, of violence and powerlessness and harm, right? So I think that, if we think about what it means to try to reorient life in a way that moves beyond that, that moves beyond that, right? And I think that our struggles are not identical, right? But at the same time, trying to move towards societies that value human life in a way that's not organized for the human lives of some over others, that's not about a small minority of some over others who are sort of naturally, you know, uh, deemed to sort of be excluded, right? That Again, that there's not, it's not identical, but at the same time, again, to bring the words of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, where life is precious, life is precious, right? So this is where we find so many marked similarities between distinct, you know, historical uh, communities struggling against oppression um, for, to, to value human life more broadly, right? To have a kind of human society that is fully <laughs> protective of human life, of animal life, of ecological life, and there are um, and this is the struggle of, of so many of our times for so many people in different places, even as we come up against, you know, different ways in which those structures exist, right? Across different places and times, right? So again, um, I don't know if I have a direct answer to that, just given the, the different histories, but I do think that what it means to think about a society that's valued, that values livingness is something that wherever we're, wherever we're positioned, um, really needs to be at the forefront again because we can see how hierarchical organization um, is also mapped onto the earth, right? And also makes the earth something that can also be treated without care, that can also be exploitable, and that this kind of thinking is what has condemned the planet to the situation that we're finding ourselves in. So we need new ways, new ways of thinking everywhere. No. Yeah, and I'd just like to say, like, um, it would be a misnomer to think that this text is, or this conversation or the exchange is, is beyond, uh, or uh, isn't relevant beyond um, anti-blackness or anti-indigenous racism. Um, but it is by um, um, two renowned um, scholar and activists that are working from those um, subject positions and in conversation about about um, um, abolishing those uh, forms of oppression, but also um, um, for all forms of oppression, including uh, specious, the land, and 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 um, um, yeah, <laughs> like it, it's it's a. Uh, it would be wrong to think that this book does not address. Um, that or call for the abolition of, of all systems of oppression, um, but spoken from from an indigenous and, and black um, perspective. So, yeah, 
Yeah, well, well thanks very much for, for that answer in particular. I just had a, a, a couple of things to say um, as well, especially, Robin, in, in, in light of your um, incredibly nuanced, critical assessment of the university and its role. And I, and I think the statement against anti-intellectualism is, is so important, because if you, if you look at authoritarian and fascist movements across the board, one thing that they share in common, along with their misogyny, is anti-intellectualism, right? So I think it's really important to have that kind of a statement. And I was also thinking of the fact that, um, that Angela Davis was fired from her position at UCLA by Ronald Reagan and the Board of Regents uh, of the University of California for being a communist. So it's important to recognize the way in which academic freedom can cut in a number of different ways, but at the end of the day, we need it in order to have these kinds of difficult conversations, right? To, to challenge the capitalist order, one has to t take up a bit of space and, and defend one's ability within certain real you know, uh, limits to, to articulate these, these critiques. And I think this is really, uh, really vital. And what, was I, what I was also reminded of is the fact that we screened this film um, by, uh, um, followed by, uh, by uh, Pipe Warden, uh, Anand Pipe Warden, and it's a, a film called God, uh, uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy War. It was a really interesting discussion of the, um, uh, the constitution of t two different religious um, uh, communities in India under colonialism through a kind of wounding um, of the, the masculinity of one uh, of those communities, which is the hin Hindu community. It was tracing the rise of Hindutva in these terms. And I think this is really you know, also quite important to understand the, the nature of the sort of inter kind of communal tensions and rivalries. So anyway, I, I think that what you've done this evening has been really phenomenal. On, on behalf of the audience, I'd like to, um, and, and all of our sponsors and partners, thank you for such a wonderful discussion. Um, thanks again for coming, and we hope to see you again at other Institute events.